Welcome to Push Go, a podcast powered by Plum, where we highlight the defining moments that impact how we live and work. Today, I'm joined by a three-time founder, author, executive coach, and board director with more than 25 years of experience guiding companies. Elise Mitchell is the founder of Mitchell Communications Group, which grew more than 500% in five years under her leadership. In 2013, she completed a strategic sale of her company to Tokyo-based Dentsu, taking on a global role to lead M&A and the company's PR investments. Today, she advises clients through her own consultancy, is a passionate advocate for entrepreneurs, enjoys mentoring the next generation of leaders, and today, Elise shares her decision to sell her company and how to leave well. Welcome back to our podcast. Really excited to have Elise Mitchell with us today. Elise, welcome. Oh, hi, Rick. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Hey, I think as we talked before, hey, you're in Nashville, so you're you're zooming in from this, or you got video calling in from this. So, uh, when did you move to Nashville? Has it been a couple of years? Well, it has actually, Rick. So we were in in Northwest Arkansas for about 20 years. We moved back here. This is actually where I started my career. My husband's from here. We moved back to Nashville right before the pandemic. So we were just fortunate enough to get in, get into a house before lockdown happened. Yeah, which was a blessing. So it sort of feels like you're going home. And I think as we talked before, you started out your career in Nashville. And did you start right out into the world of public relations? Or did you have kind of a, you know, couples, you know, left and rights before you ended up there? I started in the world of PR. I was one of those kind of crazy kids in college. It started the, my freshman day, first day. I registered wow. as a PR major, and as a senior, my last day, I graduated as PR major. It's it's really all I ever wanted to do when I figured out what the field of PR and marketing was all about. And so I started my career here in Nashville, worked for a mm-hmm. PR firm here, met my husband, fell in love, and got married. He was from here, but he was in school in Memphis. So okay. moved to Memphis, worked for a few advertising firms there, worked um, in corporate life life as well for a number of years. And then we moved to Northwest Arkansas. And that's when I took the leap to become an entrepreneur and start my own firm. Wow. And so so I know as a lot of entrepreneurs, similar in in my case, you start out in the corporate world. So you learn a ton. So tell me a little bit about how that helped kind of launch you into the private practice or entrepreneurial world, because you, you were learning from kind of both sides of the desk. Yeah, indeed I was. And I'll tell you, it actually started back when I was working for the different agencies, but here mm-hmm. in Nashville, as well as in Memphis, I, I, I feel like I had a front row seat to entrepreneurship done right. Watching yeah. these entrepreneurial companies grow and scale, I mm-hmm. learned a lot about culture and values and mm-hmm people and how to motivate people and, you know, things not to do as well. And um, so then being a client, I I learned, of course, what it is to have a client's perspective. So when I started my own firm, I kind of took the best of both of those things, those experiences and thought, how do I do the very best of the agencies I worked for and then take bring a client's perspective to my agency to try to build the best that I can? Wow. So starting out, you have that, you know, that cohort of two or three people and you start to grow Uh, Was it always Mitchell Communications where you branded something different? How, How did you come into becoming Mitchell? I think I actually have one of my very first business cards. I think I called myself Mitchell Marketing and PR because honestly, okay. I'm not. I don't think I really knew for sure what clients would hire me for. And I had I had done work both on the PR and marketing side, mm-hmm. but honestly, as I began to grow, I realized what my sweet spot was, and it was mm-hmm. definitely in the field of PR. So that was when we became Mitchell Communications Group. Okay, great. Yeah, as, as we know, as entrepreneurs, you need to have lots of lines in the water. You need to to constantly see where things are going to ebb and flow. But I love the fact that you've got this this thread in your life. My, my wife was that way. Uh, she always knew from the time she was about 10 years old she wanted to be a dietitian. She always knew food science and food and this that whole aspect of it and went to school, became a dietitian, and worked in the corporate world for P&G. But she always knew. And I love that thread that was kind of follow along with you. So outside people looking in, they see this natural. Elise Mitchell is just a natural in the PR field. Mm-hmm. Uh, but as we, we progress through, you started growing your company here. You got to be a pretty good size. Were you, what was the number of employees you had at one point in time when you think about your most, peak? Most we ever had was 110, if you could believe okay. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But primarily based here, were you starting to spread out a bit in the, uh, across the U.S. or you still stay primarily located here? Well, 
that's an interesting question. We actually had about 60 to 70 here in North, well, in Northwest okay. Arkansas was, yeah. was our headquarters. Um, but we had about 20 to 30 people who worked for us remotely, which back then, actually, that was the way I started scaling the company. When Northwest Arkansas was so small, there wasn't any PR talent much mm -hmm. to speak of in the area until the area really took off and grew. I had to hire people that lived in, worked in other places. So they, the, it was, it was kind of an early virtual network of talent oh, before that funny. became a thing. You, you, <laughs> you were hybrid totally and virtual right. before it was cool. I was, I was. So I, yeah, yeah. Necessity is the mother of invention. And that's how I figured out how to get talent. <laughs> oh, that's good. Once again, Elise Mitchell on the cutting edge of virtual and hybrid. That's so good. That's so strong. <laughs> that's such good. So as we look at you kind of progressing along, um, let's jump right into this, this point that as an entrepreneur, that this is, you know, your company, you're growing, but you made a decision to enter into conversations about being acquired or being or starting to merge. Uh, when did you know that it was time to start having those conversations? Because because I know as an entrepreneur, it's hard, it's difficult to understand even what an exit could be, but more importantly, what the right type of exit would be. So so can help us understand that decision making process for you. Yeah, you know, exiting your business uh, is always a part of the conversation for a founder because at some point, someday you will, even if you, you know, you pass away running your company, you will still exit at some point. And so it's much better if you can think more intentionally, what would an exit look like for me? Do I want to pass it on to my children? Do I want to sell it to my people? Do I mm -hmm. sell it to one of my partners? Do I sell it to an external buyer? Do I just close it up and go home? There's lots of ways to exit, mm -hmm. um, but it's more helpful to be, um, intentional to think about those things. And so honestly, I never thought I would sell. I loved what I did. I felt like we were living the dream in Northwest yeah. Arkansas. Fantastic clients like Walmart and Tyson and J.B. Hunt and P&G and others and um, great people, great culture, which we worked very hard to build and maintain. And so I really didn't ever see why I would sell. But it was funny. I start once we got to a certain size. I just started getting calls, which I think happens to a lot of entrepreneurs. Right. You get to a certain size and scale, people want to buy you. Yeah. And it was funny. I, people would call and leave messages, and I would never call them back because wow. I thought <laughs> I'm never going to sell. I'm not going to waste their time. And finally, my legal team, the, the attorneys that I used for many years, based in New York, they called me one day and they said, "Listen, these people are now calling us to call to get to you. You should take their call." And I said, "Why?" They said, because you don't know what you don't know. You mm -hmm. should listen and learn, even if it is to confirm in your mind that you don't want to sell. That is still very worthwhile. So let's I pause thought, on that for a second. I, I want you to repeat yeah. that again. <laughs> you need to, you, you don't know what you don't know. I want you mm -hmm. to listen. Let, that, that's so important, at least, mm -hmm. regardless of what situation you're in, is yeah. to be able to listen to others. That's so good. It is. And it's something I, that I was a big aha for me, which was why am I jumping to conclusions? Why do I assume I know something? I don't have a crystal ball, but maybe I should be more open and try to learn because, yeah, there there might actually be something that would make me want to sell. And I need I, I as a steward of my company, I owe it to to them, to my people and my clients to do what's right and best for the company. And so right. I need to be open. So I did start taking calls and it was incredibly informative, very mm -hmm. educational. I felt like I learned a lot about what mergers and acquisitions are all about and how I might think about it. And over about a two year period. Period, I took um, maybe a half a dozen serious calls and visited with folks about it. In the end, it was funny. I walked away. I said, well, nope, I'd never sell. Right. But <laughs> I did. <laughs> and that was certainly a defining moment in my life, Rick, was the, when I decided to sell. So, so let's speak to that a little bit because oftentimes there's a financial conversation. It's, it's a math exercise. Uh, there are other times it's relationship driven. And you, you know, I've had the conversation. So I know this was also had kind of the right person, the right company, the right time, the relationship matters. And we talk about this on the podcast all the time is that there is math out there and there's business decisions, but when you meet the right person, the right group, that relationship, it matters. So in this kind of defining moment in, in your the mergers and acquisition conversations, was there a person or a group that just kind of, you just kind of hit it off with? And was that the deciding factor? 
Yeah, well, it was one of the key factors, certainly. Okay. It was, yes, it was Dentsu is who we, we sold to. Um, Tim Andre was the person who actually approached me. He was running, um, the uh, Dentsu's based in Japan, but he was running all of the uh, businesses outside in the Western world, anything in Europe or, um, or okay. the U.S., North or South America, the, anything that was outside of Japan, he was running. And they were looking to acquire in the PR and space and build in that space. And so, yes, it was it was absolutely um, the relationships and do I are do the values align? Mm -hmm. uh, what Mitchell's values were aligned with Dentsu's? What did I think about the people? So it was a lot about relationships, but it's also about strategy. So to me, it's right. kind of these two buckets: what's the strategy and what's the the values and culture alignment? Mm -hmm. And what do you think about the people? Both have to be right. It can't just be about the strategy mm -hmm. because you've got to think. I'm going to be in the trenches with these people. Do I think that I'm I'm willing to to walk through fire with and for them? Mm -hmm. Do I trust that they will make things right when things go wrong? Um, you know, I, I'm going to up, give up some autonomy and decision-making power about my, my company. Do I trust them with that authority? There's mm -hmm. just a lot of these things that I think are crucial to for um, a, a potential, an entrepreneur, a potential seller to think about mm -hmm. what is their checklist for what matters when they think about actually going through that process of selling. Mm -hmm. And I love that. So as, uh, again, outside people looking in, they're like, why on earth would you, you know, why, why, why? And then we all know there's multiple reasons why. Uh, but from a defining moment standpoint, as you made the decision to sell to Dentsu, and we all know this didn't take two weeks. It, it's, a, it's a process, right? You have to go through this process. But you also had a, 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 almost like a second career working for Dentsu. So Mitchell was there. You're still driving that. But it also gave you a chance to enter into some completely different territory, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. in the M&A side of things. And so tell us a little bit about that, because it was kind of a defining moment of a successful CEO. But now you're entering into a larger organization, playing a different role. So it had to be not necessarily challenging, but you had to make sure, is this really what I wanted to do? So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it was really scary <laughs> because when you you're kind of when you you make a pivot like that in your career to take on new challenges, um, it is it's a little bit like jumping off the cliff. You're not quite sure if you actually have a parachute on your back or if it's going if the 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 ripcord is going to work. There's all these thoughts that go into your mind, but we never grow as leaders if we're not willing to take on new challenges and always have a learner's mindset, which is, okay, I don't exactly know how to know how to do this new thing, but I have a lot of smart people around me to help me, which I did. I'd had for years mm -hmm. at Mitchell, incredible people around me that, that it, I never could have built the company to be what it was without all of their work and their talent. So I had always been able to surround myself with super smart and capable people. And Dentsu was the same way. They had they had people globally who could help me. And so I agreed to take on the role to do mergers and acquisitions work with and for them. So it was a little bit of wearing two hats, helping to drive Mitchell's growth mm -hmm. still, but begin to look around and think about acquiring other PR firms that we might want to have join us in the Dinsu world. So it was, and also learning to work with people across um cultural boundaries in different yeah. countries, collaborate internationally. It was very exciting to learn new things. Lots of times I was <laughs> kind of freaking out. I didn't really know what I was doing. But isn't that the way life goes? We take on new challenges and we, we learn as we go. It really is. And so I love that kind of defining moment. We talk about, you know, push and go all the time. But but even as you made the decision to push go, to make the din soupies, you had Tim, you had people around you. I, I love that comment you made that you have to, regardless of where you are, what stage you are in life, you have to have that learner's mindset. That's so, so important for us all to hear because you're a successful CEO, you're driving, and it's not like you started all over, but you had to learn again. And, and so that was this, this phase in your life. Now, how long did you run M&A and how long did you continue to do that with Dinsu? Well, I was in that role for about seven years, which okay. was, you know, and it had different periods of peak activity and then other times when it wasn't quite as active, just depending on what was going on globally and in the, the macro business environment, but also what was happening within Dentsu as well. Um, but after it was a couple of years, uh, after maybe about the fourth or fifth year, I began to think, you know, I don't think I'm going to do this forever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have right. loved it. I've learned so much. There were so many amazing people and friends that I still have to this day that I met through the Dentsu world. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad I did it. But I had the heart of an entrepreneur and I knew I thought I wanted to get back out on my own. So then I had to think about making another pivot. <laughs> 
that wow. was that was another big turning point for me, for sure. So again, the outside people were looking in. They said, "Wow, you had the dream. You're running your own firm. You, you sold it. You were successful there. Now you've got another kind of career within that." Again, outside people look and say, you're really doing this amazing work. And you're like, nah, I'm just going to go over here and do this thing on my own again. So this is the one we want to drop anchor on a little bit because for many people that are, that are exiting kind of, and I'll argue you're kind of starting a new career in this next defining moment in your life. Uh, when did you know it was right? And how did you really know it was time and what got you over that, that, that hump, if you will, to say, I'm going to kind of start all over again I know I can do this. This is right for me. How did you make that call to get into the world that you're in today? And and as you're telling us that, tell us a little bit about what that world is. Okay, I'd be happy to. So I do distinctly remember laying awake in a hotel room in New York late one night and having this conversation with myself, which, you know, it's funny. It's <laughs> the best all, person to talk to yourself. I know, and myself, which is, you know, this has been a great run, but you're not – you're not really fulfilled. You're not really using okay. your talents, the, your God-given talents and abilities in this role. You, you can, So in other words, it's the question of, I can do this, should I do this? So I think that's okay. a good thing for leaders to always remember. It isn't whether you can, it's whether you should. Yeah. And sometimes that comes to a heart question, which is, what do I want to do? I can do this and it's going well. Is what, what do I feel like I want to do? So I will tell you, Rick, there were two questions that I asked myself that night while I was kind of laying there going, how do you, like you said, how do you know when is the time to do it? And the first question I asked myself was, gosh, when was I the happiest in recent years in my work? When was I happiest? What, just think of a day. What was I doing? Where was I? Who was I with? What who were the people in the room? You know, what skills yeah. were, were, were was I able to use in that moment? And I had a very distinct uh vision come to my mind of a day that I was felt very, very fulfilled and, and felt like I was really being useful in that time, making an impact. And that was really clear, clarifying because it wasn't doing PR and it wasn't doing mergers and acquisitions. Really? It was, yeah, it was doing something else. So Blake Woolsey and I, one of my very, very dear lifelong friends, right. she and I built. Love, we love Blake. Love yeah. Blake. She and I built a second company for about eight years together. And it was um, doing tr executive coaching, training, and facilitation. Mm -hmm. We, As that company grew, we actually ended up merging it in with Mitchell Communications Group. And Blake joined our team. That was a super smart decision on our part, but she and I built that company separately for a number of years. And so um, I thought about a day when Blake and I were working with a client and it was just a particularly good day. And I thought, isn't that interesting? It wasn't doing PR. And I thought, well, gosh, to be honest, I haven't really done public relations work myself in years because I was running a company. You know, running a company, right. Kind, yeah, kind of a, a business manager more than I was a PR practitioner. So I thought that was an interesting insight. And then the second question, and I think this is the really the important one, which is what what do I believe is my greatest contribution to the universe at this stage of my career in my life? You know, what is it that I can uniquely do to mm -hmm. help the world and to help other people? Well, because again, I can do a lot of things. What do I think I should be doing with my life? And really introspective though. You're yeah. really, that, that's a deep kind of, I'm glad it was late at night in hotel room staring at the ceiling. So that's yeah. very deep. <laughs> it was, it was. And it was funny when I got up the next day, It I felt so clear about how I thought about those two questions because I thought, wow, I have done a lot. I've been so blessed. I've learned a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there might be something useful to other people in what I've learned, because I've certainly made a lot of mistakes and had a lot of hard things too. Mm -hmm. Wonder if it, I could combine those two things. And so that was the magic, Rick. It was finding the intersection of my happiness and joy and what I felt fulfilled doing mm -hmm. and what I thought I could uniquely bring that would be useful to other people. And that was where I got the idea. I thought, you know what? Mm -hmm. I think I want to do executive coaching and business consulting probably with founders, with other people who are okay. trying to do what I have been blessed to be able to do. And that was sort of the, oh, wouldn't that be amazing? I would, because I would have mm -hmm. given my right arm to have had somebody like that who could, you know, help save me from lots of mistakes that I would make and teach me things and kind of, you know, shortcut the learning mm -hmm. process, maybe. I mean, a great coach can do all of those things for you. And mm -hmm. um, I didn't have a coach. I had lots of great consultants and I had a great team, but I never had a coach. And I'm sure it would have made me a better leader if I had had one. So I thought that's a great intersection, you know, of joy and impact. 
that might be useful to other people. So that's yeah. when I first got the idea. Oh, that's great. So often uh, tell people is that being successful is normally not the issue. You can be successful. Being significant is really yeah. difficult because the significant part really gets into your skills, your traits, things you love to do. If you can match that up with a job or work, you can really be significant in someone's life. It's significant for you other than just a task that you're working through. I love that significance part because you're pouring into others. Now, so you're laying in bed, you hear, you see that. Now we get into this podcast called Push Go. You just didn't walk in the next day and give your notice. I mean, <laughs> no. there's, a pro, there's a process. So when did you know, I mean, when did you say, I'm finally ready to push go? Did you have other people that were mentoring you? Did you engage others? How did you process it? And how long did it take you for, to really say, I've thought through it enough, I've planned enough, it's time to go. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Does timing is important? And in the work I do, I do work with a lot of people now that are going through this process and I caution them, be patient. It takes time mm -hmm. for you to make a pretty big transition like that, selling your company, pivoting to doing something else. Those, even if you, you're not an entrepreneur, even, even if you just think I want to pivot to do something else mm -hmm. in your life, it, be patient because there's, there's value in leaving well because you don't want to leave it alert. And you'd always tell people, don't run from something, run to something. Oh, amen. That's so good. <laughs> but, yes. be, but, but think, be kind and think graciously about the people that you're leaving behind. Have you prepared them to be able to take what you've done and build it from there and take it to the next level? You can't just mm -hmm. walk out the door. You can, but that's not usually that's the not best the right. way to leave. It's, it's, so it did take me about two years. And I started okay. with a conversation with some of my key people, my, key, my very trusted leaders at Mitchell. And I went to Tim and talked with him and said, I, I do want to leave someday. And I want to start that conversation. And let's think together about the right and best way so that Mitchell and, and all the clients and all the people there in Densu are all set up to, to not really miss me when I'm gone. And that, that was a great way for us to begin that conversation. Yeah. So, so I love, love that. At, at Field Agent, we often talk about uh, people that leave us that are alumni. And, and I tell people is that if you want to do something different, and I've been mentoring you as an employee working for Field Agent, mm -hmm. if you tell me you want to leave, and I said, well, then give me a two-week notice and leave, then obviously it wasn't a true mentorship you know, relationship. I was just using you to get work done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it also goes the other way. If you just leave without giving me a chance to come alongside you, then shame on you too. And so what we found, again, it's, it's not often two years, but what we find is, is that we'll have some people that want to leave and we love to come alongside them to, because we want them to be successful mm -hmm. because we want the relationship to continue because you can, you can come back, who knows what it would look like to re-engage again. So you felt confident in talking to Tim and others because of the relationship that during that two-year period, because that's a long time at least, mm -hmm. a long time, what were some practical steps that you did to get you prepared for the next thing? Because obviously you were going to end well, because that, that's your heart. You just said that, I'm going to end well. But you still had to be working, I'll call it nights and weekends on the new thing, because you weren't going to leave and then, well, now I guess I need to start planning. Mm -hmm. What were some practical things that you started to do to prepare you for the next mm -hmm. role you're going to take on? Right. The very first thing I did was just in those conversations with Tim and others was to check my uh, legal obligations. But, you know, where okay, is the, yeah. what, what's a non-compete? What do I need to do to be honorable in how I pivot? And um, and also the timing, which does point to, I, I want to make the, the, be sure to make the point of how important succession planning is. Yes. You know, the best leaders are those who build a team around them that can take over if, if you mm -hmm. were to have to leave, for sure. You don't want the business to be all about you. You want it to be about your team and your brand. Mm -hmm. And so you want to have an, enough robust talent in the in the pipeline that you that you won't be as missed. So part mm -hmm. of that is then preparing them for your departure and talking with them a little bit about that and when and how that will go and how to manage those communications with the uh, with clients and the employees and things like that so that it's properly done. Um, but then it was also okay. So if I'm going to become a coach, I need to get certified. <laughs> I need to get. Okay. I mean, I could hang out a shingle, but I didn't want to do that. Sure. I knew there was a there's definitely um, competencies and processes that you should learn about in any profession to become a good one. So I I went through training and mentoring and past 
passed a number of exams and earned my certification through the International Coaching Federation and um, began to um, practice coaching and get get the I had to get over 100 hours before I could get my certification. So I had to start working with people on the side um, at no cost, but just to get my get my mm-hmm. skills up in terms of coaching. Coaching was quite different from what I did as a consultant because a coach mm-hmm. doesn't tell you what to do. A consultant is paid to tell you what to do. Yeah. <laughs> a consultant is a little bit more, I'm sorry, a coach is a little bit more about helping the coachee to discover their own insights. Mm-hmm. So it's a little bit more about asking questions and guiding and encouraging and challenging. It's it's similar, but, but can be quite different. So mm-hmm. I needed to hone some skills to learn how to be a coach. And then I had to build a website and had to figure out a brand for the mm-hmm. new company and all of that, you know, but I, I still remember the when I announced I was leaving and we told the team well in advance and they were so great. They threw me a going away party and we all hugged and cried. It was wonderful and lots of rem- reminiscing and thinking about things. But uh, December 31st, midnight, 1201, when my laptop from Mitchell sh- turned off and shut off, I will tell you, Rick, I mean, it was supposed to because that's when IT was set to turn it off. Right. But it was still such a shock. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, oh, like I'm actually really gone. Like somebody in London pushed a button and my laptop was turned off because it was supposed oh, to. Funny. But it was like, wait a minute, don't you know I started this company? How could you lock me out of my computer? <laughs> and I thought, but at least you're leaving. But it was so, again, I guess the point there is you can know it cognitively and rationally, but in your heart, it can feel different to actually walk out the door. And mm-hmm. that was... That was really hard. Oh, gosh. Now, I'm, I'm going to use an, an age conversation here. You're younger than me. But the important part for, for all of us to think through is that I love where you went down the path of saying, I needed to learn. I needed to get certified. So for someone that's been a CEO a few times, I mean, you've run a few companies, you've done this, I don't want to say it's necessarily humbling, but there's a practical part that says you just can't go off on your own and start something. There is a process to follow. And I love the humbleness you're showing is that I didn't know what I didn't know. I needed to to learn, which you said that earlier. And now you needed to rely on someone that could have been 30 years old that was going to teach you how to be a coach Mm -hmm. and run you through a process. And I think that's really important for people to hear is that when you start, and it's almost like a new career for you Mm because your point was, I'm not a consultant. I'm not a CEO. I'm a coach. That's a brand new career. So a weekend, a month in, was it refreshing or was it nerve wracking? It's like, oh my gosh, can I do this? Did you have a little bit of doubt or did you like, no, I got this. This is at least version 3.0. I'm just going to nail everything that I'm doing. Well, I wish it were the latter, but it wasn't. <laughs> I remember a few months in just sort of waking up one morning and thinking, I can't believe my my docket is not completely full with clients who want me to coach them. And I thought, maybe nobody wants to hire. <laughs> and it was just, it was such a funny feeling of, Oh, wait a minute. Anything you've ever built from scratch takes, it took time to do it. It takes time. You have to be patient. You have to market yourself. You have to. So I I became very uh, committed to writing to my blog and doing webinars for people and building my email marketing list, all the fundamentals we know, what it takes to build a company. I just sort of forgot like, oh, I thought I was just going to waltz over from one successful career to another. And no, guess what? You know, if you're going to build something from scratch, you're, you're starting over and you need to be uh, determined and resilient and you need to put yourself out there and you need to work at it. And the, and it, and it worked, it did grow over time, but it took time. And so I think that is a good aha is don't expect to just be proficient and confident and completely successful. When you start something new again, just because you have been in your past life, does it mean you shouldn't be patient to learn the ropes and become successful again on your own. It will take time. I love that. I love that. So uh, as we finish up here in a couple of minutes, uh, we've been referring all along about the coaching, kind of what you're doing. Tell us about your world today. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about the consulting side of things, that kind of that target for you, the sweet spot, and uh, just kind of lay it out for us. If we were talking to Elise today, how could you come alongside someone like Rick? How could you help me out? 
Yeah. Oh, thank you. I, you know what? I love what I do. As much as I loved the ride of being an entrepreneur and building Mitchell, it was one of the greatest rides of my life. I really, truly love what I do now. And this is what's so funny about it, Rick. It is, I had this real aha when visiting with my children one time about like, what are your values now in life? I had them go through this values exercise. Oh, God. And I, I, they were like, well, mom, what's yours? And I was like, oh, I haven't done a values exercise in years, you know? And I sat down and you know I came up with some very different words now I'll give you an example huh. for all the years I was an entrepreneur one of my big values was achievement you know was driving for results reaching a goal I always say I was a destination person you know like get mm -hmm. there wherever there is you know what I replace that with now is impact and I began oh, wow. to realize yeah I began to realize my kids wanted to know about that and I said well I I will say my greatest joy now comes from helping other leaders to become the best version of themselves. Like, I don't want to be the leader anymore. I want to help other leaders be great. And there is so much joy and reward that comes for me when I can help someone to learn and to grow. And I, so I sort of have this mission statement in my, my mind now is I want to, um, you know, uh, help the world be a better place one leader at a time, like changing the world for good one leader at a time. Because just think mm -hmm. about it, as as a leader goes, so goes a team, a company, mm -hmm. a community, mm -hmm. a church, a home, a country. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. the ripple effect of leaders is great. So what greater work can there be for me than to come alongside leaders and help them become the best version of themselves? And so sometimes that is for them to learn new things that I might be able to help them to learn. Um, it might be um, talking with them and giving them a different mindset about how to face a challenge or to have more courage in the way they approach their their work. Um, sometimes it's just me being super practical with them going, okay, here's three ways that you can try to not lose your cool so much when you are emotional in the moment. Sure. You know, So there's all kinds of practical things that we talk about. And then sometimes they it's just creating a safe place for them to talk with someone who understands and has watched walked the same path that they have, maybe just a little uh, further along that path. But I, I have been through all of that myself. And there's not that much difference in leaders from one industry to another because leadership is pretty universal. The challenges right. that we face, the anxieties we have and the hopes that we have. Right. And you need somebody who can help you to show up at your best. And that's mm -hmm. that's what I do now, mostly with founders. I do have a number of corporate clients, but I, I okay. it seems that mostly entrepreneurs are the ones who find me and want an entrepreneur to help them to, to scale and grow their company and to become a great leader. I love that. So if people were trying to track down a lease today mm. and they were saying, hey, I heard you ride motorcycles and you wrote a book <laughs> and there's a picture of a motorcycle on the book. If they're trying to understand that, which is a great book, great story, by the way, Thank you. or they Thank wanted you. to engage you, what's the best way for them to A, find out about your book? Because I'm sure you mm -hmm. could probably pitch that real quick. But more importantly, if they wanted to engage you, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Yeah, it's just my name, elisemitchell.com. Is the, the, I have a website set up. That's one of the things that my marketing team, help, digital team helped me early on. Hey, yep. just go with your name. Most people will know you by your name and it's easier to find than, than my okay. company name. So I just have a website, elisemitchell.com. I do coaching. Um, I do a lot of public speaking since I wrote my book a number of years ago. I, I actually do a lot of um, speaking, love that. Um, do some leadership and team training, work with a lot of teams. So mm -hmm. love, I love all that. It's just, it's such a joy for me. Well, that's great. I love the simplicity of EliseMitchell.com. Even I can remember <laughs> that. So listen, Elise, yeah. it's been fun to have you on today. Oh, Thank you thanks, so Rick. much for being a guest and I can't wait until next time. Thank you. I love you dearly. And I so appreciate the chance to visit. Okay. Talk soon. Thanks for listening to Push Go, a podcast highlighting the defining moments that impact how we live and work. It was fantastic having Elise on the show. If you like what you heard, you can find out more about stories just like this on listen.plumshop.com. And hey, wouldn't be mad if you left us a review wherever you listen to podcasts. New episodes drop every Wednesday. And if you're watching on YouTube, feel free to like and subscribe. And before you go, we have a quick Plum Spotlight, a weekly segment where I give you a sneak peek at what we've been up to at Plum. Today, I want to highlight a click and launch ratings and review product available exclusively on Plum. Retailers require them, shoppers rely on them, and Plum Provider Field Agent makes collecting reviews faster and simpler than ever before. 
Check them out on plumshop.com. And of course, I've got a deal for you. Use the code PUSHGO, P-U-S-H-G-O, for $100 on your first purchase.